welcome Ryan Fitzpatrick, Director of Third Way's Climate and Energy Program, and Anne Verhe Henke, the Strategic Director of the University of Michigan Center for Socially Engaged Design. I'm Ryan Fitzpatrick, um, and I am the Director for the Climate and Energy Program at Third Way. Third Way is a multi-issue think tank uh, based here in Washington, D.C. Hi, everybody. I'm Ann Verhey Hanke, and I'm the Strategic Director of a Center in the College of Engineering at the University of Michigan called the Center for Socially Engaged Design. On behalf of both Ryan and I's institutions, we're honored to welcome you to week two of this four-week series of Tuesday conversations on how the United States can get on the fastest, most equitable path to net zero emissions using every clean energy resource we possibly have. The theme of today's program centers around innovation and the role it plays in achieving our climate goals. We've got an exciting lineup of speakers who can offer insights on this topic from a number of different perspectives. First, we just need to take a few moments to review the tools and rules for these virtual conversations. We also want to encourage you to tweet about the conference using the hashtag fastest path to zero. You can tell others about your favorite parts of the program. You can also let us know what you'd like to see more of in the remaining weeks. Last but not least, uh, we ask that everybody treat each other with respect and dignity and that you follow the code of conduct that we asked you to sign when you registered for this conference. We want to foster a safe community without fear of online harassment and bullying, where you can feel free to share your thoughts and ideas. And that's it. Uh, so if we were doing a session on innovation at a climate conference like this, even five years ago, we probably would have needed to spend a considerable amount of time just defending the idea that innovation has any role in the climate fight. And this was a long drawn out debate led by a relatively small, but unfortunately very loud group in the energy community. They argued that clean energy innovation was a cop out. It was unnecessary, it detracted resources from efforts to get current technologies built as fast as possible. And that's not the case anymore. You know, we have ample evidence now that innovation has an important role to play. The IEA found that about half of the emissions reductions needed to achieve many of their decarbonization scenarios, they rely on technologies that aren't yet commercially available. We need policy steps to accelerate their development. Uh, it's also well established that the longer we wait to make these cuts, the higher our risk of severe climate damage. So we continue deploying while we continue innovating. Um, you know, as most innovation proponents have said all along, this is not the silver bullet for climate change. Innovation is one piece and an important piece, but one piece of the larger strategy. And that seems to become the common viewpoint among climate advocates. So luckily we don't have to spend too much time on whether innovation has a role in climate efforts, but we do still need to have a conversation on what kind of role innovation can play. So among the questions we'll discuss today are, how do we get the most benefit out of our innovation system? And how can we make innovation more inclusive to make sure we're benefiting from contributions that different communities can make and that more communities share in the actual benefits of the innovation and what it produces. So we don't want innovation to go from a controversial term to a buzzword, you know, something that we say a lot without really identifying what goes into it. Um, it's, uh, it's easy to glorify and to oversimplify innovation as a solution, especially for policymakers you know, that have a lot of, uh, on their plates right now. Um, if you think about it, people generally love innovation, clean energy innovation included. So poll after poll shows solid majorities of both Democrats and Republicans support clean energy innovation uh, and the policies that advance it. When we're dealing with a problem as hefty as climate change, and you're debating policy solutions that require these massive changes in regulatory structures, or you're figuring out how to build a mind boggling amount of new infrastructure at a faster rate than ever in history, energy R&D can start to seem like a quick and easy fix, right? You, you send a bit of money, um, maybe more than usual, but a bit of money um, to some very smart people in a few very large laboratories, and they'll deliver the results you need. And that's more like how you would storyboard a Schoolhouse Rock episode about clean energy innovation. It is not how we're going to get what we need out of our innovation ecosystem. So we're talking about more than sending a bit of money. Um, you know, experts from Columbia and ITIF and elsewhere recently put out a report 
saying that the U.S. needs to triple its investment in clean energy innovation over the next five years, going from $9 billion to $25 billion. Um, in the grand scheme of things, I would consider that a bargain for climate solutions, but you know, politically speaking, it's not chump, ch chump change. Um, you know, this funding also has to be consistent, and it has to have the durability of support to survive costly fail failures. There will be some, there have been some, this is part of the process, and people need to be supportive enough to stick with it. Um, you know, it has to come with active management, uh, also clear objectives for commercializing technology that's most valuable in achieving climate targets and active management. You know, a lot has changed since 2005 in terms of our energy ecosystem. But tomorrow, the House of Representatives is taking up a, a package, the Clean Economy, Jobs, and Innovation Act, and it contains several bills to modernize some vital innovation programs and, and offices at the Department of Energy, some of which haven't been or had you know, the, a real serious update in 15 years. So active management is key. It's not just sending money out the door. This is oversight, it's proper staffing, and most importantly, it is a thoughtful strategy. So these are the conversations we need to have to get beyond the schoolhouse rock version uh, and into effective policy support for clean energy innovation. Wow, thank you, Ryan. I think the parts I would add to the conversation that kind of spark people's minds to be listening about and thinking about is like in that buzzword of innovation, what do we kind of imagine our mind innovation is and what does it look like? I think oftentimes people, you say the word innovation and it conjures up these images of something super technically sophisticated and something that happens outside in a big company in a national lab. And it's not in reach of the general population to understand and participate in conversations around innovation. So this conference is, I said probably five minutes ago, is both about the fastest path to zero, but also ensuring equity along the way. And in order to ensure equity, we must change the perception of who participates in the development of innovation. To do so, we have to acknowledge that true innovation isn't just technically sophisticated, but also equitably deployed and adopted in a variety of contexts with a wide scope of users. This is what successful innovation looks like. It's used. So it works both technically and socially because it works with and for the people it was actually in, in, innovated for. So then we also have to think about the broader context of, the, of in which innovation ha happens. So something could be technically right and innovative, but to be disconnected from the social and human context in which it will be used. And this, I would argue, sets innovation up to fail. So we heard from Ryan that there's bipartisan support for clean energy, but also one of the things he didn't say is that, they all, that people also perceive these things as happening outside of their own communities, outside of their state, it's happening to others. So how can we build a sense of it's happening with us and that the us is inclusive of an, of an entire we? Um, so we do that actually by engaging communities and stakeholders who we hope to adopt and adapt these technical innovations into their everyday practice. And so I think later we're going to hear from Jackie about some data they're using to kind of understand who is already receptive to the ideas of, of nuclear or other clean energy um, opportunities. And what I would challenge all of us to do as we kind of move forward in today and for the next few weeks in the series is how might we think about innovation that is both co-designed, co-owned, and, co and co-deployed by both the technical experts, but the expert of the experts of those who are going to experience the deployment and adoption of those technologies in, in their everyday life. And if we start to do that now, as we begin this innovation process, that will actually ensure the success at the end and not having to, to go back and fix things that we didn't see were going to be a problem because we weren't engaging all stakeholders in the conversation. So many of these themes are gonna come up for you today. And so I really ask you to continually ask yourselves this question of who is part of this conversation and how do we broaden that definition of, in, of innovation to conclude all stakeholders, not just the technical experts. Thanks, Anne. Um, so uh, I now have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker. Um, so like Anne and myself, we are not, uh, we're not engineers and neither is Richard Kaufman to my knowledge. He's never worked in a lab, 
Um, but Richard has contributed heavily to innovative policy tools and, and financing mechanisms to enable technological innovation um, and to help get new clean energy solutions deployed at scale. Uh, Richard Kaufman held senior positions at some of the world's largest investment banks through the 90s and early 2000s. Um, and you know, also, he's worked with financial institutions and energy businesses to pioneer new ways of aggregating and purchasing clean energy. Um, in 2011 and 2012, Richard served as a senior policy advisor to President Obama's first energy secretary, Dr. Stephen Chu focusing on policies that could create more opportunities for clean energy through capital markets. In 2013, Richard became what's often referred to as New York's first, quote, energy czar, um, serving as the top energy advisor for Governor Cuomo uh, and overseeing the work of several agencies, including the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, NYSERDA. So during his tenure, New York took on some of the most ambitious and really innovative climate and clean energy initiatives of any state in the country, um, most notably through a policy known as Reforming the Energy Vision, or REV. Um, REV overhauled utility regulations um, and it created some multi-billion dollar funds to support clean energy development in the state. Uh, it enabled New York's aggressive clean energy standard and, and a lot more. Um, Richard gave up his, I guess you'd say Zardom, um, at the beginning of 2019 but he continues to serve as chair of NYSERDA and a close advisor to the governor on energy policy. Um, we are honored to have him here with us today. Richard, I'll hand it off to you. All right, and here I am. Thank you very much, Ryan and Anne. It's great to be with you all. So uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about uh, wind today and more specifically about offshore wind. And it's not because I'm proposing wind projects in Lake Michigan, although I know some people have done that, but because offshore wind offers an illustration on the obstacles facing innovative energy solutions. And offshore wind also gives an example of how government policy is changing, at least at the state level, to overcome these obstacles. And together with what corporations are doing, and I'm not gonna talk about corporations, Government policy is driving innovation in the investment world. And these two changes in the policy and investment worlds, and they're still in their early stages, represent one of the past, one of the fast paths to zero. So we all know what onshore wind turbines look like. They've got three blades, and you've seen pictures of what offshore wind turbines look like. Uh, manufacturers have adopted the same three-bladed design. However, it turns out, and again, as Ryan said, I'm not an engineer, it turns out that three blades might not be the most efficient design, that in fact, a two-bladed turbine design might be better, It'd be easier to manufacture with lower head weight and therefore less maintenance costs. But there's a reason why we haven't had two-bladed wind turbines uh, in, offshore, in onshore wind, and at first is because two-bladed wind turbines are noisy. And the second reason is an aesthetic one, a two-bladed wind turbine uh, would bother some people because it would look as though the blades stopped for a moment at the 12 and six um, position. But offshore, 30 miles offshore say, noise and aesthetics are irrelevant and the benefits of lower head weight and lower maintenance costs even greater. So this is a classic clean tech opportunity, an innovative solution superior to existing technology with a large potential market. So why don't we just all leave the session now and go into business together, designing, manufacturing, two-bladed offshore wind turbines and getting them deployed in projects. But before we take that plunge, let's consider some of the steps that would need to be taken to take this idea from idea to commercial success. First phase would be in the lab. We would do some computer design, build a small model, do wind tunnel tests. We would need to build a larger scale prototype, start engineering and developing plans for building a factory, hiring people. We then need to build the factory and sales force to sell turbines to people developing projects. And perhaps given the new technology, we'd want to develop projects ourselves. And all this, of course, would take time and money. 
first phase of design would take a few hundred thousand, building a prototype and engineering a few million, building a demonstration plant, tens of million for full scale production, maybe hundreds of millions. Each of these stages would require us to get funding from dedicated financing silos, seed investors, early stage venture capital, later stage VC, growth investors, per perhaps eventually going public. And to develop projects like would likewise would require specialized financing silos, project debt, project equity, and tax equity. And the reason all these silos exist is for the same reason we have so many medical specialists. In general, we believe that people developing particular expertise are gonna do a better job. Well, the problem for our startup two-bladed offshore wind turbine company isn't just the complexity of going to different financing silos, it's that these financing silos were set up to finance other sectors of the economy, not for capital intensive clean tech companies. We need to fit into structures designed for another purpose. I think most of us have seen how the VC business model is inconsistent with the time scale and capital intensity of our wind turbine manufacturing business or other clean tech uh, capital intensive businesses. The VC business model favors putting small amounts of money across many bets, feeding those that seem to be working, then cutting off those that aren't making commercial progress. VCs need to have exits to raise the next fund and to pay uh, carried interest to their partners and need to know that if a company needs more money, that there'll be another investment firm that will be willing to commit more money at potentially a higher valuation. We can't be surprised then that VCs would have much more interest in investing in a software solution that would optimize placement and operation of offshore wind turbines rather than invest in our business. These are obstacles at the early stage of company development, but there are equivalent obstacle, obstacles in obtaining financing in the deployment end. Again, we're trying to fit into silos of investing and financing that were developed for other sectors of the economy. So when I talk about financing the deployment end, I'm talking about in financing projects that use our turbines. Most projects use the specialized technique of non-recourse project financing where cash flows from the project support the dedicated project debt and equity. Project finance is inconsistent with financing innovative technology, given uncertainty of capital and maintenance costs and performance risk. And so part of what would take us so long to get to market is that banks would need to see how well our technology worked before they'd be willing to lend to projects. And without banks willing to lend, there wouldn't be investors willing to invest in the projects. And therefore, if there's no project financing, no two bladed turbines to be sold. And even if the banks were willing to lend, some number of infrastructure funds that you would think would be natural investors in wind projects wouldn't be able to invest in our first projects under their charters. Many infrastructure funds can't take development or construction risk. We can't be surprised then that for years, entrepreneurs, investors, and policymakers have fretted about the valley of death for capital intensive clean tech innovative companies. And without leaving our seats, we can imagine that our little company might meet the fate of so many others. So if we're thinking about innovation, we always, almost always think about this famous valley of death. So I'm here today to tell you that things are changing and changing because government policy, at least in some states, has begun to change. And with the change in government policy, the investing and financing world is changing. And I'm gonna say that again. I'm here today to tell you that things are changing and changing because government policy, at least in some states, has begun to change. And with change in government policy, the investing and financial world is changing. So here's the old government approach. And to be fair or unfair, it still exists in many quarters. Cost of renewable energy and other climate change solutions are too high. So we need to invest in innovation to lower costs and then deploy. Um, we would fund demonstration 
first of a kind projects, and then fret over the valley of death. And perhaps what's needed is some government entity to fund companies through their capital intensive scale up period. Well, through some very hard lessons, we learned that there are a number of problems with this approach. The first is that it hasn't been working. That's not why, that's why we're not on the fast path. Investing just in innovation won't lower costs enough. It's almost impossible for a new technology to achieve cost parity with conventional solutions when conventional solutions have the benefits of enormous scale. The fossil fuel industry is one example, is one of the most mature industries that we have. It's not likely that someone in a lab is going to come up with a widget that can compete on costs, nor is funding some demonstration project going to create scale. The key insight that we've come to is that we may have gotten the innovation deploy cart and horse backwards, or at least wrong. Rather than innovate in technology to reduce costs and then deploy, we have learned from the European experience in solar and wind, European policy demonstrated that developing large end markets created an economic prize that would draw in innovation and capital formation that would accelerate cost reduction. You know, we've, we've all heard of Moore's law in semiconductors, that capacity will double every two years while costing less and less. But Moore's law isn't a law of physics. If anything, it's a law of markets. Some of the cost declines in semiconductors have been driven by invention, but some of the cost reductions have come about from manufacturing scale of making small improvements in manufacturing processes that are spread over many millions of chips. And that's the kind of linkage that we need to develop between markets and innovation. And markets matter, which takes me to the valley of death problem again. While there, were, while there uh, are indeed problems of trying to fit financing of clean tech into financing silos designed for other sectors of the economy, the valley of death problem doesn't exist, for example, in the biotech world, where there is substantial capital put at risk. Venture firms understand that the time to get a drug tested, approved, and manufactured is long and costs are substantial. But they're willing to make these investments because they know that there'll be a handoff to the next investing silo of growth investors who are willing to make investments of tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to sustain the business through extensive trials and eventually to manufacture. Growth investors are willing to take technology or market risks, but not both. Biotech investors assume technology risk, but they're confident that if a drug works, there'll be a ready market. In clean tech, we've been asking investors to take both technology and market risk, and that's one of the key reasons we have a financing valley of death. So the emerging government policy is informed by the relationship between markets, innovation, scale, and costs, that funding a single project builds a pier, not a bridge. And so I wanna end by, again, going back to offshore wind. And you may have noticed, but seemingly overnight, offshore wind in the East Coast has taken off. New York State is committed to deploying uh, 9,000 megawatts by 2035, and that's equivalent to 30% of the state's power. And of that amount, 1,700 megawatts have already been contracted, and there's a procurement out for the next, uh, for the next uh, uh, set of uh, contracts. None of this happened by accident. It was a result of state policy innovation. Away from funding a single project and towards thinking about how government funding could be used to develop a self-sustaining market. You may remember the ill-fated Cape Wind project off of Cape Cod that was never built. This was an example of older thinking. Spend a lot of money and effort to try to get a single project built, but even if, if it was built, it wouldn't lead to further projects. Instead, New York State did the following. We determined how big of an end market would be needed 
to be attractive enough for the offshore wind industry to invest in it to lower costs. We knew that New York State wouldn't have an influence on turbine costs, but through establishing a big enough market, we could have an influence on reduction of all the other costs, platform, construction, port, shipping, and installation costs. We further stimulated an even larger market by encouraging a friendly competition among other states. We reduced development costs by working with the federal government to identify sites. We further reduced development costs by doing extensive studies on environmental, commercial, and recreational fishing, and by engaging with local communities on economic development and visual impact concerns. We mobilize the local supply chain by identifying the economic opportunities to local companies and connected this supply chain to major European developers and manufacturers. This work involved hundreds of companies and establishing a line of sight from turbine to tugboat, as it were, meant that developers could better assess their costs and establish strategic supplier relationships. And in building for contracts, this work the government did enabled developers to sharpen their pencils when submitting their, their bids for contracts to build the projects. So what's been the result? Well, not only has New York a 9,000 megawatt market, other states have joined in, so the committed East Coast committed East Coast market is now 30,000 megawatts. And in terms of costs, the contracts that have been signed in New York averaged 8.4 cents per kilowatt hour, which is 40% lower than NYSERDA's own estimates done in 2018. These initial contracts will cost customers about 78 cents per month. And these lower costs are a result of larger markets over which to spread fixed costs, and innovation in all parts of the supply chain, including in foundation and installation design. And the US Department of Energy is now funding an offshore wind R&D consortium that's located in New York State so there can be a tighter connection between innovation and market deployment. Developing large markets, reducing soft costs to drive lower costs and encourage innovation is the lesson of the offshore wind. So this emerging emphasis on market development isn't just in offshore wind, but it's informing other technologies, even things like ground, horse, ground source heat pumps or and more prosaic problems like building retrofits. We can also see this approach on market development working on emerging technologies such as, such as hydrogen. Uh, we could see the same approach used as offshore wind, a small but increasing amount of hydrogen in pipelines to establish a market, aggregating with other states, other states to create an economic prize that will attract more capital and innovation to drive down costs. So what does this offshore wind story mean for you? What can you do? First, not all governments have the playbook. You can help government leaders develop market development policies by giving them an equivalent of an industry business plan, how government can reduce soft costs through uh, aggregating customer demand or reducing development costs or financing costs. If there's a subsidy need, how it can be used as a bridge to a self-sustaining market, how markets connect to the innovation engine. We can't be on the fastest path to zero unless we get more governments on the same policy path. The good news, by the way, is that this policy approach stretches public dollars much more than the old ways of just funding single pilot projects. And second, follow the money and how, follow the evolution and innovation and in how money is invested. It is changing and not just because of the pressure of ESG, but because of the need for investors to get returns. Most fund investors think that it will be very hard to generate returns in the stock market in the next 10 years because of low growth and high valuations. They're beginning to turn to clean tech opportunities, not just in clean tech, but through the whole financing chain. With bigger end markets, investors are understanding that there are inefficiencies which exist between the investing silos, again, that have been set up 
for other uh, sectors of the economy and that there are investment opportunities that exist by adapting the existing silos to clean technology. We see some VC firms with longer investment horizons, uh, growth investors entering the space now that they see that they don't, take, don't need to take as much market risk, just technology risk, infrastructure funds willing to take some construction and development risk. And also, the larger the end markets, the larger the investment opportunities for institutional investors that need to invest tens or hundreds of millions of dollars at a time. Those of you who stay close to these changes and how money is invested will have attractive financing opportunities for your innovative ideas and therefore will be able to fund different business strategies than what you may have experienced in the past. Changing policy and changing investment silos are two innovations that are on the fastest road to zero. And I'm happy to say that we're well up on the on-ramp. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard Kaufman. Please welcome Todd Allen, Chair and Professor of Nuclear Engineering and Radiological Sciences at the University of Michigan. I thank you very much, uh, uh, Jared. I'm uh, pleased to be able to, to host this panel this afternoon. Uh, get the uh, panelists up here and we'll introduce them uh, to have this conversation about uh, global markets for advanced nuclear. And you see the panelists popping up. All right, welcome everybody. So I'm pleased to be joined by uh, Jackie Kempfer, who's the Senior Policy Advisor of our, the Climate and Energy Program at Third Way. Uh, Todd Moss, who's the Founder and Executive Director of the Energy for Growth Hub and Rose Matiso, who is the director for the energy, uh, research director for the Energy for Growth Hub. So welcome everybody, appreciate that. So let me start the first question and I'll target it towards Jackie and Todd. Um, why should we be talking about nuclear energy at a fastest path to zero conference? And in that context, can you tell us about this global markets for advanced nuclear mapping tool that your two organizations launched today? Sure, uh, thanks Todd. Um, so I'll start just by saying that everyone participating in the fastest path to zero summit is largely united in the belief that the climate crisis is a clear, present, and growing danger, and that we don't have time to play favorites with carbon-free technologies. We need every tool available to reduce carbon. And while we've made incredible strides over the last decade in clean energy technologies, we have not come close to reaching the level of innovation needed to truly confront climate change. To do so, we will need breakthroughs in storage, advanced geothermal, carbon capture, and advanced nuclear. And just as the original prototypes do not resemble today's solar panels and wind turbines, tomorrow's nuclear looks very different from the plants of today. The next generation of nuclear power will be more cost effective and safer than ever, because if it's not, it won't succeed in the marketplace. Since 2015, Third Way has been tracking the commercialization of advanced nuclear projects in North America, and over the last five years, we've seen these reactors progress far more rapidly than anyone could have predicted. But we're not alone in this pursuit. Russia and China recognize this opportunity and are aggressively developing new reactor designs to capture the emerging market for advanced nuclear and the global influence that will come with it. And that's why Third Way set out to develop this new map. We wanted to highlight the very real opportunity and strategic need for the United States to reclaim its leadership in an industry that is critical for both climate change and national security. And to be frank, an industry that will soon leave us behind if we fail to act. And we knew that the Energy for Growth Hub and Todd Moss were the perfect collaborator for this work. Todd. Great, well, th thanks Jackie. Uh, thanks Todd and, and thanks Rose for joining us. Look, we, you know, the Energy for Growth Hub, if, if you don't know us, we are a nonprofit research network dedicated to the idea that everyone on the planet deserves a high energy future, that all people and all countries need the modern, reliable uh, energy systems at scale to meet their own, their own development goals, their own job creation targets, and especially for uh, countries which want to industrial, industrialize, which is all countries. Um, and so we were really thrilled to partner with our friends at Third Way 
um, to try to really answer a question that had been bugging me for a little while, which is whether uh, advanced nuclear technology was only going to be for rich countries um, or whether there were going to be um, a broad range of countries that were going to use this technology. Um, now, we think a lot about uh, the future of uh, energy demand, and we knew that future energy demand was mostly going to be in emerging and frontier markets, but we hadn't seen country by country analysis of what the future electricity market would be. We also knew that there were a lot of different countries taking steps to prepare for advanced nuclear, um, but we hadn't seen a systematic analysis to see okay, who's really serious about this and who's just kind of signing MOUs and, or talking about it. Um, and so we wanted to do both of these things and especially we wanted uh, to see the overlap uh, between the two. Um, and so that's why we were, we were super thrilled um, to, to team up with Third Way. Um, and before Jackie shows you uh, the map, I, I, I really wanna thank the data team and the conceptual team that created this and every number behind this, this super cool map um, was put together by an amazing team, including uh, Jessica Lovering, uh, Jake Kinser, uh, Noor Eide, and Milan Chandra. Um, so just wanna acknowledge all, all of the hard work that went into um, the back end of what you're about to see. So thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna take a few minutes to sort of walk everyone through um, what we are showing in this new map. Um, and, and what you'll hopefully uh, visit the page and play around with after our presentations over today. So as I mentioned earlier, Third Way has been tracking um, the commercialization uh, sort of path for all of the different advanced reactor projects under development in North America for the last five years. And there's currently over 70 different projects under development. Um, and we've just seen a ton of rapid progress in this area uh, where we're now rapidly moving towards first construction and demonstration of some of these advanced reactor designs anticipated to be um, mid-decade of this year. So we know advanced nuclear energy can play a meaningful part in addressing climate change and growing energy demand, but as Todd mentioned, we wanted to know how meaningful and which markets might be ready for this new technology. So to get at these two points, we set out to answer two questions. Who will be ready for nuclear power in 2030 or 2050? And to do that, we developed what we call our nuclear readiness rubric, which is a six stage color, green, yellow, red, are the top three that show how prepared and interested countries are uh, in, in nuclear energy. And then second, we asked how much additional electricity demand will be needed by 2050. And so we estimated future electricity demand in 148 countries that are illustrated on the map and using a model based on International Monetary Fund, UN, World Bank, and International Energy Agency data. And so what we found was a big potential market for advanced nuclear, a potential market that spans all regions and all income groups. What you see here is an image of our map, and I wanna walk through what you're actually looking at here. So first, each of the 148 countries in our analysis is marked with a circle. The size of the circles represents the projected additional electricity demand for each country in 2050. And the color of the circles represents where each country ranks on our nuclear readiness rubric. And then if you look across the top, you'll find seven different filters. The first is a six stage scale describing each country's relative preparedness and motivation for the development of advanced nuclear power. The second, is projected percentage growth in national security demand, uh, national electricity demand from 2017 to 2050. The third projects additional electricity demand in terawatt hours for each country in 2050. Then we have the World Bank's four income groupings, low, lower, middle, upper, middle, and high, and that's based on GNI per capita. Then we have the World Resource Institute, Re World Resource Institute's projected water stress ratings in 2040. Now, the reason we've included this is because nuclear power desalination could play a significant role in addressing the growing demand for potable water and provide an option for areas with acute water shortages. Next, we have the 2020 Nuclear Threat Initiative Nuclear Security Index ratings that assess actions related to supporting global nuclear security efforts. And then right next to that, we have a second metric that we've pulled from that same index with rankings for 46 countries with nuclear facilities to assess actions to protect those facilities against sabotage. 
So I just want to walk quickly through a few of the key takeaways from our findings. Global electricity demand will more than double by 2050, and 90% of this growth will be in emerging markets. Through this process, we've identified 62 demand engines, which are countries whose electricity consumption will more than triple. And of those, 14 are in Asia, 35 are in Africa, and none are in Western Europe or North America. So these same fast growing emerging markets are ready or nearly ready for advanced nuclear technology to help meet part of their future energy demand. And 86% of new global electricity demand in 2050 is projected in countries that are ready or will likely be ready for advanced nuclear power by 2030. Finally, the global market for nuclear power could triple by 2050. And under these conditions, new nuclear power could produce up to $400 billion worth of electricity annually. So with that, I'll open it up to Todd to kind of walk us through some, some additional highlights and, and sort of what we were all most excited to see uh, through this process. Thank you. All right, uh, thanks, Jackie. That's a great overview of the map and, and I think probably eye-opening for some people. Uh, let me follow up with both Jackie and Todd then. Um, you've gone through this process, you may have had an idea of what the map was gonna show you when you started, but in the end, what surprised you? What were the findings that maybe you didn't anticipate that you find really interesting? Um, well, I'll go first on that. So look, I'm a, I'm a, uh, my entire career, I've been working in Africa, I'm an Africa policy junkie. Um, and I knew that some of uh, the countries in the region had been thinking about nuclear um, but I was really surprised at the end of the day about the diversity of countries, not just in Africa, but across the world, that were taking pretty concrete steps, more concrete than I expected, uh, steps toward preparing for, for advanced nuclear. And just to, to look back at, at Africa, you know, on our map, there are only two green countries right now, that's Egypt and South Africa, uh, but we identified another seven light green who could be ready uh, within, within uh, a decade and I would expect the majority of them will be ready uh, within a decade. And then there was another 17 countries um, that we've scored as yellow, which mean that they've taken some initial steps. They have plenty of time to get ready by 2050 if they continue down that road. And I would expect a sizable chunk of those countries also to, to do that, especially once the smaller, cheaper, and more flexible advanced nuclear designs are actually commercially available. Um, and just a, a one thing that I'll just add to this before turning back to Jackie is that in a weird way, you know, we, we often say that the United States is way behind Russia, um, but the Russians have been, have done us one small favor here, which is their very aggressive marketing, even before their SMRs are, are ready, um, has really uh, sort of set the table for, for other players to come in um, and, uh, and, and show what their technologies can do. So, thanks. And how about you, Jackie? Yeah, I mean, I think first and foremost, um, what surprised me the most was just how big the potential market is and how far reaching it is, especially with the conservative projections that we actually use for this project. Um, our map only includes projections that look at new energy assets um, and new demand. It doesn't include replacements for, for fossil fuel generation, uh, you know, or retiring nuclear plants. Um, and, you know, Numerous countries, utilities, and manufacturers have plans to achieve net zero emissions by or near mid-century. And in the utility world, 2050 is just one investment cycle away. Um, the average lifespan of a natural gas generator is 22 years, and plants that produce things like cement and steel uh, can run for 20 to 50 years. And so for me, our analysis and, and the map itself really shows just how big a role advanced nuclear can play um, and draws attention to the need to fully commercialize these technologies so that they're ready uh, for these markets uh, that are gonna need them by the mid 2030s uh, so that they can help us reach the goal of zero by 50. So it's sort of just really honed in on um, the sort of pressing timeline that we have and that we face. Um, 2050 sometimes can seem a bit far, but when you think about uh, you know, how much work we have to do, uh, Mr. Kaufman touched on this earlier, uh, it's really the next decade where we have to do the lion's share of the work to, to get these technologies ready for market. Um, yeah. All right, thanks. And, and Rose, I'd like to then bring you into the conversation. And maybe the same question that I asked Jackie and, and uh, Todd, take a look at this, this map. What, what surprises you? What, what do you find interesting? 
Yeah, so definitely the Africa picture was quite surprising for me. I also focus on African energy. And to be honest, I think for many people, putting Africa and nuclear in the same sentence is kind of almost frightening. Um, and even for me from Africa, I was very surprised, for example, to see Kenya on the light green, not because, you know, we are aware of, uh, you know, the government is signing MOUs with China and Russia. And, uh, South Korea has a new nuclear agency, has announced plans for like a $5 billion, like five gigawatt plant and like by the end of the decade, you know, and we just kind of take that as pie in the sky, cognitive dissonance, just the government saying crazy things. Um, and so I think what I like about this map is to, I think maybe providing some time bounds um, and some quantifying a little bit what is possible, whereas on the ground in Africa and even as kind of energy policy people, people are watching the energy space, nuclear has been really hard to put up, to, you know, to, to wrap around because governments are doing things that don't seem to map with the reality, but this is really, I think grounded some of that thinking. Um, I think I'm. I think 2030 for me, even for the light green countries, um, I think is a little bit too early. But 2040, 2050, I can, you know, I'm now convinced uh, as part of this process that that is entirely possible for Africa. Sorry, let me let me follow up on that. Um, you know, given your Africa experience, do you think that the input parameters that the mapping team chose, right? They looked at water, they looked at nuclear security, looked at growth. Do, did they miss anything? Was that bounding the problem really well? I think it's a very good start. I think one thing that's missing is um, when, uh, well, two things. I think there is obviously going to be a lot of energy demand growth in Africa. We're starting from a pretty low baseline where, you know, our demand is very suppressed. We are ambitious and serious about development. Um, so far, our track record in achieving development goals has been quite slow. So, um, you know, very ambitious industrialization goals, very ambitious demand projections. And so far we haven't hit that mark. So I think I'd be more um, uh, conservative with, you know, where demand is gonna go just given the trends. But again, you know, sometimes with Africa, all bets are off and, uh, you know, a lot, a lot, a lot is happening. I, it's hard to tell where the next decade will go, certainly. But so far our track record in achieving those demand goals have been low. Um, and so, and then the second thing that I think is a limit is, you know, I think our power sector fundamentals are still quite weak. And so even if we had the demand, um, you know, our grids are crumbling, our utilities are going bankrupt, um, the governance, the power sector is really weak. I think that the, the ecosystem in which, to which nuclear, which has, I think this map does a good job of kind of um, characterizing the nuclear specific um, issues. It, it was good, but then there's this whole other ecosystem um, the ecosystem gaps. And I think African countries are working on that uh, aside from the, obviously aside from the nuclear uh, issue that we need to get our power system fundamentals right. And then I think that the public, you know, I think there's a real, you know, we, you know, we, we really, you know, we can barely trust our governments to do simple things like primary schools, you know. And so I think a lot more work needs to be done to build public confidence um, uh, because the public will obviously be very involved in this. And yeah, but overall, I think I, again, I feel like in the next kind of 20 year cycles, countries like Kenya will be very much at that point. Yeah, that, that's great. And actually your comments, plus what I heard Richard Kaufman just say uh, in the keynote actually brings me to my next question with, and for all three of you, maybe we'll go Jackie, Todd, and then Rose, but what are the policy implications then of the map? Right. I think Rose is, is pretty clearly saying that there are some developmental steps which invire, involve the right policies to get you ready for the technology. So, and I don't mean to ask the question just in terms of Africa, but broadly, if you look at your map, what are the policy implications that you derive from that? Maybe start with Jackie first. Sure, yeah, um, I'll, I'll certainly speak to, to sort of, uh, you know, some policy themes that we, we drew out um, of how sort of the US government can play a bigger role in, in sort of helping um, hit that goalpost, if you will, of sort of end of decade commercialization and deployment of these technologies. Um, you know, we've already seen a lot of positive first steps. Um, we've seen the U.S. Congress pass a series of bipartisan bills um, that have mo helped modernize the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and prepare for licensing these reactors. Um, we've opened up our national labs to collaborate with developers. Um, and we just recently saw the launch of the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program uh, at DOE. Um, but there's a lot more that we can do to give America's advanced nuclear industry the tools it needs to, to really get its products to market and displace high emitting fossil fuels. 
Um, so I'll just briefly touch on a couple. Um, the first uh, is really to reestablish the US government as the first funder and customer of US advanced nuclear. Um, and one of the ways we can do this is uh, to have the Congress pass legislation that provides a longer term, meaning uh, 30 years or more, uh, federal power purchase agreements for clean energy technologies across the board, inclusive of nuclear. And the second would be to codify into law that advanced reactor demonstration program that I mentioned. Um, we've seen first funding for that come through with last year's appropriations, um, but in order to really uh, feel confident in the completion of this project, we want to see that um, confirmed uh, to its completion. Um, and then we say, you know, we got to update the U.S. nuclear uh, energy e uh, export process and increase uh, international engagement efforts ahead of U.S. advanced nuclear, te nuclear technologies hitting the global market. Um, as a first step, uh, we look at things like some of the international agreements uh, that the U.S. has to have in place with different countries before we can export technologies um, and what it looks like to, to sort of preemptively pursue those um, before we necessarily have a product that's ready, ready to go. Um, and then I would also talk about, uh, you know, a need to uh, really just have a clearer sort of uh, interagency system within our government um, to support the development and deployment of advanced reactors. Um, this can be done through things like establishing nuclear specific staff positions across the federal government um, to better coordinate sort of our, our international and our domestic strategy when it comes to this. Um, and then I'll, Todd is definitely uh, much uh, better to speak about uh, sort of the uh, financing sort of piece of this. So I'll, I'll stop there and let him jump in. Okay, yeah, great. Th th thanks. Uh, look, Jackie's highlighted the sort of regulatory and policy issues that are there. Rose's um, well-grounded skepticism uh, suggests that, you know, there's still a lot of work that has to be done and that there's a really important public policy role there. Um, but when you look at the marketplace, these are mostly, you know, a lot of the growth and the countries that are getting ready are going to be in, in markets that do not have currently ready access to private capital um, at commercial rates. And especially for long-term infrastructure uh, projects, that's why the develop, getting the development finance tools right is going to matter so much. Um, a lot of the, uh, most of these markets need uh, some kind of public policy intervention or some kind of soft uh, financing tool for long-term investment. Now, we've, the U.S. has made a pretty big step forward, which is just two months ago, our bilateral development finance institution, the DFC, lifted a long-standing prohibition on any nuclear project. So they are now open uh, to, uh, to, uh, to nuclear projects in these frontier and emerging markets. And that's really critical to de-risking uh, the, the, the projects in, in the long term. Um, but it's a one small agency. Um, there are a lot of other agencies out there that can provide finance uh, for, for infrastructure, for necessary infrastructure, not just nuclear, but across the board. Um, and they need to, you know, many of them are, um, are picking their favorite technologies and many of them are not involved in nuclear for, for mostly legacy reasons. Uh, so I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done to modernize these institutions so that they understand that the next generation of nuclear power is not um, is not what they think, um, not what they think, and the reason that they might have gotten out of it 20 or 30 or more years ago. So thanks. Okay, thanks. And, and Rose? Yeah, so I would say, I guess maybe two big things for me. Um, uh, one is uh, the global uh, kind of in terms of policy prescriptions. I think the first is that the global energy community, including the financiers that Todd mentioned, really need to start seeing Africa and poor countries where a lot of the growth is going to be in demand and where the markets are. They need to see them as kind of peers on the global energy stage. And I think this map and such projects are good first steps where people start to understand that this is a reality and a viable pathway. Um, and that like certain technologies are not just for rich countries or, you know, that kind of a mindset. Um, I think my second kind of policy prescription would go to African countries, which is I right now there's a lot of interest in nuclear, but really a lot of traditional nuclear technology. So I would love to see African countries really pursue aggressively advanced nuclear technologies, because I think that this way they can stage growth in ways that make sense, given the demand uncertainty, given safety concerns, just, you know, just 
Um, you know, so that's something that I think is missing from the conversation. And then obviously, thirdly, I would just say that African countries and their partners really need to fix the fundamentals and the power system so that the whole ecosystem is ready to absorb um, a wide range of energy sources to meet this growing demand. Yeah, thanks. That, that's, that's great, Rose. And I think with a lot of the advanced nuclear companies thinking of different size products than just gigawatt scale electricity, it may fit into a narrative where different countries have different development needs um, in a way that's very positive. So um, we're at the end of our time here. I really want to thank the panel. Um, I think this is a fascinating project. Uh, clearly, my next weekend or two will be spent mapping around. Um, and thanks to Todd and Jackie for making that possible. And I think I'll, um, besides thanking the panel, I'll end up uh, by taking on the tradition that Brad Markell started last week, which is bringing in our own University of Michigan swag, right? So here's my Juwan Howard bobblehead. And that's where I will send it back to Jared. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Todd, Jackie, Todd, and Rose. When we think of an innovation hub, we usually picture Silicon Valley, the location of thousands of growing startups and renowned high-tech companies. With this narrow focus on the Valley and other coastal areas like New York and Boston, we've overlooked a wave of innovation happening in the middle of the country. Communities across the Midwest are developing and embracing innovative solutions in clean energy, sustainability, and manufacturing. We took a closer look at exciting clean energy innovation ecosystems in states like Wisconsin, Michigan, and Ohio. These states have a surprisingly long history with clean energy innovation and are starting to make a concerted effort to grow their clean energy sectors. It was researchers in Wisconsin who initially decoded the genes of E. coli, which unlocked the massive production of biofuels. And today, Wisconsin is home to one of the country's leading bioenergy research centers, working to crack the code on clean alternatives to transportation fuels. Speaking of transportation, Michigan, the birthplace of America's automotive industry, has continued to develop the cutting edge manufacturing resources and engineering expertise needed to lead the country in advanced transportation, like electric vehicles. Just five years ago, the University of Michigan built M-City, a world-class mobility research center where academic researchers, business leaders, and industry partners are working together to commercialize emerging transportation technologies. Ohio was home to the country's first electricity generating wind turbine, developed by a Cleveland-based engineer in 1888. Today, innovators just outside Cleveland are attempting to launch the first freshwater offshore wind pilot project. This project, named Icebreaker Wind, is specifically designed to deal with the severe winter conditions of Lake Erie, so the technology could be used in similar sites across the Great Lakes region. Wisconsin, Michigan, and Ohio all have unique stories of overcoming energy challenges with innovative solutions. As we move toward a 100% clean energy future, we're going to need to tap into their inventiveness, their experienced workforce, their outstanding university systems, and their unique manufacturing capabilities. If these states play to their strengths, continue to invest in their innovation ecosystems, and get sufficient support from the federal government, the Midwest could blossom into a global leader in clean energy and transportation technologies. Move over, Silicon Valley. Please welcome Jennifer Haverkamp, the Graham Family Director of the Graham Sustainability Institute at the University of Michigan, and a former Obama State Department Ambassador and Climate Negotiator. Lovely to be with you all this afternoon and to be part of such an important topic that we're discussing today, um, just how much can innovation do? Uh, you have uh, heard uh, quite a bit already today about areas of innovation, important ones such as advanced nuclear and offshore wind. Uh, we have a wonderful panel today to take this question a little broader and a little deeper. We're going to step back and look at just what role innovation can be playing in the fastest path to getting us to zero net emissions. Our panel has been asked to address the question whether investing in clean energy innovation can get us the last tons we need to eliminate quickly enough across enough of the economy 
and to do it in a way that is just to workers and to frontline communities. Our time is short, and so without further ado, I will briefly introduce each of our panelists. Dr. Lisa D. Cook is the Professor of Economics and International Relations at Michigan State University and a former senior economist for the Obama's Council of Economic Advisors, where she focused on innovation, entrepreneurship, and the Eurozone. Julian Brave Noisecat is Vice President of Policy and Strategy with Data for Progress, a left-wing think tank that recently published a project on a progressive climate innovation agenda. Joseph Mikett is the Director of Climate Policy for the Niskanen Center. And my colleague, Dr. Michael Craig, is an Assistant Professor of Energy Systems at the University of Michigan's School for Environmental and Sustainability. And having seen Todd in the last panel wiggle his bobblehead, I think it's safe to give a shout out to the University of Michigan and uh, what fun it was to see scenes of our campus in the video that we all just watched hearing about the innovation that's happening in the Midwest. So panelists, uh, I might call on one of you to start the conversation around the questions that I have to pose to you, but I want each of you to feel free to weigh in uh, and if necessary, if you'd like to comment on each other's responses. So our first question. Some would say that we already have the technological tools we need to greatly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We have solar, wind, geothermal, energy efficient lighting, energy efficient building materials. What we really need to be focusing on is lowering the barriers to deployment of these existing technologies through policy incentives and behavioral change. So what's wrong with that assessment? Are there areas of technology that are in need of innovation and what are they? Joseph, would you like to start this conversation? Happy to and thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> I feel very two ways about this conversation because I think the question is not, at, you know, not to beg the question, but uh, to say that there is a lot we have in the toolbox right now that, that can be used to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by significant margins, right? So if you're looking at the power sector or the transportation sector, there is a lot of technology uh, either currently or available or in the offing that um, is being held up by sort of implicit or explicit subsidies of current business models or the consumption or emissive consumption of fossil fuels. So we can do a lot with the stuff we already have. And we're already seeing kind of over the past few years in the United States and in other places, a pretty profound change in the outlook for greenhouse gas emissions with things that are available right now. Um, that's being said, if you're talking about getting to net zero, which the climate which demands are. that we do, that's an entirely different problem. It's like, I can make a lot of changes in my life and I can lose five pounds, but if I wanna get back to my college weight, I need to really rethink some things. And that is where innovation plays a significant role, right? Um, the EIA looks at net zero decarbonization targets and you can beg that you can kind of argue with their models, but they find that 50% of the emissions reductions that we're gonna need from industry, from buildings and from other places are gonna require technology that is not commercially available today. And that's, the, that's where the innovation challenge really lies. So there's way more that we could be doing now but there is much more that, we ha that we're gonna have to do over the next few decades if we wanna get to net zero on a, on a climate relevant time scale. We have to be able to walk and shoot gum at the same time. Sounds right. Yeah, Michael or like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, Michael, tell us your college weight and how you would answer that question. <laughs> My record keeping is not as good as uh, Joseph's, I guess. Um, so I, I largely agree with uh, what what uh, the prior panelists said, and thanks so much for having me. I Most of my research is on the power system, and I agree. If we look at the power system, we have a lot of great technologies that we can deploy now and that we have seen amazing growth in. And the electric power sector generally is viewed as one of the easier to decarbonize, the first one to go when you look at these 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius plans, because it's pretty easy, pretty cheap relative to other sectors. But even in the power sector, 
we have a lot of institutional barriers that mean that the technologies that we have, we maybe can't use at the scale that we want to yet. And we also have some innovation needs, even in the power sector. And I call out a few sectors in addition to power that we are, I'd say, really behind on that we need a lot of innovation in. And that one would be an industry where we need low carbon heat and there's a lot of work remaining to do there. Uh, and another is in negative emissions. And this is an area where you look at all these 1.5 degrees Celsius reports, the IPCC had their report a few years ago, uh, even two degrees Celsius, when we talk about net zero emissions, negative emissions play a huge role in many, many, many of those plans. And I think we have some innovation ongoing with that. We have some demonstration projects, some, techno some companies that are carrying them forward, but those are areas where we need a lot more innovation and that are really linchpins to many of our pathways to net zero. Great, thank you so much. Julianne or Lisa, would you like to weigh in on this? Okay, I'll go then. Uh, well, firstly, thank you so much for, for having me and for the opportunity to be on a panel with so many um, brilliant folks. Uh, you know, third way, obviously, we disagree, disagree on a number of things, but climate policy is apparently not one of them, which I find to be a fascinating overlap. Maybe we can get into that. Uh, also, of course, University of Michigan, um, some great research comes out of these organizations. Um, you know, very recently, uh, Data for Progress, uh, the think tank where I manage a, a small but growing climate uh, research portfolio and team uh, put out a progressive climate innovation agenda a re report. Um, we had two young uh, research leads on that, Jake Higdon and Arjun Krishna Swami. Um, and, you know, part of the reason that we were investing in this is to uh, sort of back up Joseph's point, you know, there is uh, a, a real need uh, when you look at the various projections uh, for, you know, innovation to, uh, you know, create and, and, and bring to scale a number of various technologies that are, are just not really existing in the world uh, today. Um, from the progressive perspective, of course, Data for Progress has progress in its name. We are a left-wing think tank, as you introduced us. Um, there is unfortunately actually a, a, a long-standing divestment politically, uh, and then also from a, a policy and research perspective uh, in the uh, sort of innovation agenda as part of the sort of climate um, suite of policy tools that we need. Uh, and this sort of stems from uh, a sort of view that innovation has unfortunately for, for a number of years functioned uh, from more conservative elements of, of the conversation as uh, you know, a stopgap mechanism or even sort of a, a, a way to forestall real substantive action on, on climate change, or at least that's the view that has persisted among folks on the environmental left is that you know, you can imagine folks like Lamar Alexander and, and other uh, conservatives, you know, talking about how they want to use innovation to take on climate change. But when it comes time to actually, um, you know, reduce emissions or, or maybe put a price on carbon or in, implement regulation, they're like, oh, we don't, we don't want to do that part of the agenda. And the result has been that progressives uh, as, you know, a force who has a lot to say about other policy areas, uh, you know, we are sort of a uh, an ideological movement that has big ideas uh, has very little to so far has had very little to sort of offer in uh, the innov innovation space. And so that's sort of where um, the sort of impetus for our report, uh, which had sort of three parts uh, that came out uh, a little less than a month ago uh, was from and that included uh, firstly sort of uh, outlining a heuristic on which uh, we might judge innovation policy from a progressive perspective. So very, very briefly, we thought that that should include three things, uh, whether firstly it can attack uh, emissions, secondly, whether it can expand rapidly uh, a number of the technologies that we need. And then thirdly, I think a point that we probably will get into a little bit more in a bit, uh, whether it includes equity. Uh, we think that equity and environmental justice, these sorts of considerations, both domestically and globally should be part of the conversation on innovation. I'd included some specific recommendations for policymakers, uh, and then lastly, some polling. And I think one thing to note here is that innovation uh, is uh, not just a place where sort of political elites on, on different sides of the aisle might actually agree, uh, but it's also a place where we see a lot of public support um, for climate action and, and clean energy priorities. So 
uh, you know, typically, um, unfortunately, climate action is, is now a very polarized issue. You'll see Democrats saying that they love it, they support it, um, and Republicans obviously being in a different place. Uh, but specifically on the innovation question, uh, we routinely see support uh, above 60%, even when you throw in uh, pro-con or even partisan arguments on each side of, of, of these questions, uh, which suggests that if there is a place in this day and age, which maybe there's not, uh, for a bipartisan agreement or um, at least diverse agreement about these questions, innovation might be one of them. So uh, excited for this conversation. Fantastic, thank you very much. And uh, by searching for Data for Progress Innovation on Google, you will immediately find their report. So I encourage people who want to be, uh, dig deeper to go read the report. And your comments, Julian, were also a great transition to the, the next area we wanted to get into, which is, okay, assuming we do need innovation, um, can it deliver what we need fast enough? What are the obstacles to innovation? And um, what are the most important steps that need to be taken in order to spur the needed innovation? We talked a little bit about that, but I'd like to uh, ask other panelists as well, both to address what are the ways to incentivize innovation, but also what are the major impediments to this? Um, what has to happen if we're going to try to speed up the timeline between an invention and its commercialization? First, what's the R&D to get it invented, and then how do we get it out and to deployment? Um, Lisa, why don't you start with that one? I'd be happy to start. So again, thank you for inviting me to this conversation. I think one of the big problems with respect to innovation in this country generally is that there haven't been enough people at the table participating in it. So a calculation that I made with a co-author shows that uh, women in underrepresented minorities uh, not being in the, uh, in the process of innovation generally makes it such that we lose 0.6% to 4.4% GDP per capita per year. So this is huge. This is huge. So with respect to innovation generally and innovation with respect to uh, climate change and the environment, we're not including as many people. So what we want to do is to have as many ideas flowing as possible ideas about the innovation itself and ideas about the adoption. So let's talk about the adoption of uh, some of these technologies that will get us to climate zero. Um, behavioral economics has a lot to say about that. And we can certainly harness some of the results from behavioral economics, but people are heterogeneous. So we want to make sure that all communities are engaged in this and that behavioral economics delivers uh, some of the results that might have everyone adopting many of the changes in uh, behavior, conservation, et cetera, that might be required. On the innovation front, we need to tap into communities that possibly know more about switchgrass than we know. All of the biofuels that are to be invented have not yet been invented. So, you know, we, that it just as an example, uh, we need to tap into all of the uh, ideas that can come forward and they have to be infinite. We don't have those uh, technologies yet. So I think that there are several policies that I've uh, put forward, including uh, a recent uh, Brookings paper uh, about what we need at every single stage of innovation to include more people and more communities. And let me tell you something, among underrepresented minorities who are the recipients of so much environmental racism, they're going to be ultra motivated. They're going to be absolutely ultra motivated, but they're not very represented among say uh, earth and oceanic sciences majors. There are only uh, two to 10% of majors or recipients of master's and doctoral degrees. We, we need to bring in more ideas. We need to find out where we're missing uh, something because it's gonna, it's gonna be all hands on deck. We see the emergency that's in front of us. It's gonna take all hands on deck and all ideas on deck. Great. Joseph, you looked like you wanted to weigh in on this. Well, yeah, first of all, uh, Lisa, I have to commend your paper. 
caused a, a very spirited dinner time discussion in our house last night. So thank you for uh, showing us something so important. I actually have like a, a cross question, if that's permitted. Yes. Um, you know, you, you know, innovation comes from a couple of places, right? It's easy to think of it as just like, okay, here's a brilliant inventor working at a workbench. Boom, here's this cool machine that does something nice. But market pull matters too, right? So one of the one of the one of the ways that we design the innovation pipeline is early support for inventors, public private partnerships and demonstration projects, subsidies to bring things online, and eventually, you know, we want a marketplace that's going to take these new, better, cheaper, less polluting technologies and allow them to scale up. And when we think about this justice question, I actually have a question. I, I, I'm, I wonder how much either your findings help you understand the question of, you know, on the innovation side, do you find that GDP gap, which is like incredibly large? Um, is that because there's just fewer inventors, right? Is it a mass question? Or is it because inventors who understand the market conditions that their inventions are gonna be used in are important? Um, does it, does that, is that a clear question, right? Is, is this the composition of the innovator pool matter or is it the size of the innovator pool that matters? It's more the innovator pool. If people are trained in the same way, they come from the same schools, they've trained, but been trained by the same people, they ask the same questions, you're going to come up with the same answers or similar answers. You're going to get marginal changes in innovation. But if you're bringing people who have different lived experiences and they ask different questions and the ideas therefore are flowing, it's a composition of the team that matters. So let me give you one result from uh, a previous paper. What I find is that mixed gender patent teams are more productive than single-sex female teams or single-sex male teams. That tells you something. People are doing things differently. So you're leaving money on the table. You're leaving progress on the table if you don't have these integrated teams. So I think, again, in this emergency, we have to have all hands on deck. It's really the composition that matters. Thank you. And, and speaking to that, if you have particular recommendations, uh, Lisa, for how to get more of those hands on deck, that would be great. And I would also ask other panelists to weigh in, what are the steps that policymakers can be taking or others to take to spur this innovation? What, what are, and who needs to be doing them? I, I can hop in with a couple of recommendations, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Please. Uh, so, in my uh, Brookings paper, I was focused on uh, commercialization, but in another paper I'm writing, I'm focused on the earlier part of innovation, uh, education and training, and the practice of innovation itself, actually uh, patenting. And one of the things that I think that has to absolutely happen, whether we're talking about one end of the process or the other, is to change the workplace climate that exists in STEM fields. And some fields already have this worked out. So economics is a STEM field. We don't have it worked out yet. We're working hard on it. We don't have it worked out yet. Mm -hmm. But chemistry and biology, for example, do. They have made much more progress in getting uh, women and underrepresented minorities into those fields. Engineering has a ways to go, and there's a lot of heterogeneity within engineering. But I think the, the process of getting uh, girls, young women in, uh, interested in uh, environmental science uh, will, I think, be informed by all these other efforts uh, in chemistry and astronomy, uh, biology. Uh, so I think that's where it starts. Another thing is uh, mentoring. And what do I mean by mentoring? It's not just uh, mentoring uh, woman to woman or uh, African-American to African-American, but just seeing how inventors work. One thing we know from uh, the work of Raj Chetty and uh, his co-authors at Harvard is that early exposure to invention is associated with uh, better life outcomes. So more, uh, well, certainly invention, uh, higher salaries and, and so on. 
So I think that one of the things that we can do with respect to mentoring is say, take as many kids as we can to the Lumisun Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation at the Smithsonian. Because there are steps, there, there's a little process that you go through in walking through that center that shows you how to not only become an inventor, make something interesting and useful, you get to take the invention home, but also how to commercialize it so that people can actually use it. So that's the way to get, I think, people interested early, children interested early in this process, especially if they haven't been exposed to it any other way. So I think there's a lot to do with respect to the demonstration effect. That's great. Julian, you said that you had recommendations in your report. And yeah, there, I mean, there's, they're kind of, they cut in a lot of different directions. So um, I guess one, just to like start at the very uh, sort of top of the, the stream, if you will, is just sort of the way that we conceive of the mission and goals of uh, many of the sort of existing, um, you know, programs under DOE, for example, um, and also the ways in which we, um, you know, exclude uh, sort of equity uh, for communities and workers and other things like that in the ways that we um, conceive and then also the way that the current administration, frankly, uh, continuously in its own budgets tries to cut those out of, um, you know, the, the White House budgets that it proposes every year. Um, I think that even the notion that equity should be a concern uh, for, for, for folks who are interested in innovation policy is um, quite sort of marge. I mean, I think it's probably shared by the folks on this panel, but in like the real world where we actually are considering these questions, it seems to me to be to be quite marginal. Um, and was one actually that that, for example, there was a write up from Dave Roberts, who I'm sure folks who um, follow these issues, you know, follow his reporting and writing. Uh, one that I found interesting when he was writing about our report and another one that was much thicker, honestly, from the from Columbia University was one that he really like took um, our think tank and our authors to task for, you know, like he, uh, he wasn't questioning whether it was like a good idea, but he was more um, sort of, you know, wondering how you in operationally like uh, could get this through, you know, the Senate as it exists, or even as it could exist in 2021 in terms of like funding for programs, and then also how you could, um, you know, administratively uh, operationalize these sorts of things. So, you know, I think that there's, there's just, um, it, just even from like the way that the, the programs have been conceived and function right now, there is a lot of, uh, even among folks who are interested in uh, like a more diverse pool of inventors and then also the way that those uh, impact communities and who becomes inventors and also how, uh, you know, various consumers are benefiting from these things. I think that it's like still a very marginal um, concern, if that makes sense. Michael? Sure, yeah. Um, I, I think all the points that have been made so far have been really great. I was at the National Renewable Energy Lab and the National Labs are one of those overlooked diamonds in our in our country doing amazing work. Um, one of the things that struck me when I was at NREL though is that there are not many social scientists there. In fact, I think there are um, fairly few social scientists at that national lab. And that's one of those instances where NREL does amazing work full of amazing passionate people. They, you know, generate these reports every year that have amazing knowledge for us. Um, they do basic R&D, pushing forward innovation on that end. Um, but thinking about how we can uh, think about where we're trying to go with these technologies, I think is really important. I mean, we're at the point where we don't have the luxury of doing basic R&D, finding a material, then understanding how that might plug into a larger system, and then doing the analysis of how do we deploy that system? Because 10 years down the line, then you're like, oh, actually this is not gonna do what we want it to do, or it's going to aggravate existing inequities. And so let's abandon that. We don't, we don't have that luxury anymore. We're at the point where we um, need to do something. We should have been doing something a long time ago. And so in terms of who should be doing this innovation, I think we're at the point where we need everybody to be doing innovation at all the scales relevant and try to, as much as we can, get them in tandem with one another so that 
we're not just thinking about the basic R and D. We're thinking also about here's the institutional frameworks that we're going to be putting these technologies in. What might a technology look like that could fit well in that institutional framework? And that also lets us then target the investments that we're making now to avoid having things like stranded assets, uh, unwise investments that just cause more inertia down the road. I would love to hear other people weigh in on that because I think you've raised a really important dimension of this, which is the urgency. Well, we need to get the kids going to the Smithsonian for the longer view. We also have to have stuff deployable very quickly if we're going to be getting to net zero by 2050. So other ways to speed up innovation or get it out the door faster. Well, um, <clears throat> if I may, I mean, I, I, it, this is a net zero, you know, imagining a net zero world makes this kind of tough because we don't know exactly what it's going to look like. Mm -hmm. Right. When innovation accrues benefits to individuals, it can happen relatively quickly. Like, you know, this whole revolution came after I graduated from college and I'm not old enough yet that that's like that long ago. Right. Mm -hmm. And and so a lot of the questions of, you know, we have to think about identifying what are the innovations we need to do that can be kind of consumer choice driven versus what are the innovations that are gonna happen sort of behind the consumer veil, right? So I, when I flip a light switch, I, I don't, well, I do because I'm so deep in this stuff, but like the average person uh, doesn't have to, probably doesn't and probably shouldn't have to think about where did that, where's the power coming from, right? They have like other things that are important in their day, but the average person is consumed about their power bills and they'd like to see them go down. And so, you know, I'm interested in my, my colleagues views on you know, what are the programs and how do we, how do we create a, a policy environment where uh, lower income people or low information people um, or their combination have the ability to, to see some of the cool innovations that we think are part of the net zero solution. So here I'm thinking of demand response technology. So you have a smart home that can flick the lights on and off or can s spin up or spin down your, your temperature control or your refrigerator. It's all fancy stuff. It's all coming online now. And it's all a big part of net zero, uh, but it's probably, you know, the comes with the fancier models. There's a heavy capital investment that pays off over time. And there are like real information and financing challenges to getting those into the hands of all consumers. Um, so I'm kind of interested in how my panelists think about that. What are the right tools for, for approaching, for approaching that problem? Cause I don't think it's something as a policy community we've quite figured out yet. I, I think that in thinking about the broad array of products and processes that are part of net zero. Again, I'd like to involve the behavioral economist who will help us in thinking about how to foster adoption. And I think that for uh, lower income, lower uh, information uh, communities, for example, there needs to be a cooperative extension type service that demonstrates, and this is what happened you know, during the Great Def Depression. This is one of the things that emerged from the Great Depression, going out into rural areas and teaching uh, people how to use seeds and how to deploy that kind of uh, technology, how to uh, fight against erosion. And I think there are uh, fairly simple things that can be done for which we can have a kind of uh, cooperative extension core or service and, and doing this. But I think that we might need to think about deploying different types of technology at different times so that we're not overly ambitious about uh, lower income, lower information, people taking on the burden of something that requires a smartphone like ours. Uh, this is something that I've been investigating even with my mobile money proposal and getting people stimulus money quickly. Not everybody has a smartphone and sometimes we have to think about what's going to be most useful in, uh, in everyday lives. This notion, for example, that individuals are motivated by being compared with their peers right? So on your energy bill, this is how you're doing in comparison to your neighbors uh, and who's uh, most energy efficient. I think that moves a lot of people, it, it, whether no matter what the uh, income, everybody gets this bill. 
and they get it in paper and it's even more vivid when it's in paper. I can't tell you how many of my friends have complained to me, an economist, about seeing how efficient their neighbors are. That means that it's working. That, that they are, and this is across the income spectrum. So I'm, I'm thinking that we really need to double down on the types of technologies that can be deployed across the board that don't require a lot of information, try to get uh, mass adoption, and then differentiate. Uh, just do, you know, run, run the table, all ideas, all types of uh, deployment techniques. But now is an emergency. We need to get those uh, folks from all these communities involved in the innovation process and in the deployment planning process to make sure that these are adopted and adopted uh, efficiently and quickly. Mm -hmm. I'll just add real quickly, I and mean, maybe this will show my social democratic leanings, but um, you know, the, one of the biggest purchasers is, is still the federal government, right? Um, and procurement is one way in which you can uh, drive not just sort of the innovations that we want, but I, I would also argue some of the more equitable outcomes that we want in society. Um, things like buy clean, for example, legislation uh, can encourage not just, uh, you know, uh, purchasing of lower emissions or pollution, um, you know, technologies, but also require project labor agreements, uh, other equitable outcomes. So that's one area of, um, that's one area that we we speak to in our report, uh, among others. Maybe. Although I imagine some other folks might have a different view of what the federal government should be doing. <laughs> Look at Joseph. <laughs> yeah, Joseph. Well, I'm not gonna I, I I'm not gonna bomb you with numbers because I don't have them. But I think you know when we think about these kind of. The distributional outcomes associated with innovation, right? Buy clean is a thing that could could redoubt real benefits to organized labor, but it might really harm consumers, right? Because the prices get passed on. So, so like I, I, it that's not to dismiss any of it. It's just to say that there's a, you know, when we think about the the whole innovation pipeline and the and the movement of value in between producers and consumers, oh, we need to keep I think both sides of the of the equation in mind. Because what we want, I think we all agree, is a world where higher, and, and what innovation really delivers, right, is a world where uh, um, businesses and industry and, and technology can deliver higher benefits at, at lower cost, right? That's eventually what we want to achieve in the long term. Yeah, I mean, I would generally agree that there is, to a certain extent, an economic trade-off between more jobs and labor costs and things like that and lower energy costs and costs on consumers. I think that that's a generalizable point that can be made across um, various essential uh, services and goods. Mm -hmm. So Michael, having worked at NREL, do you have more thoughts on what the role of the federal government or state governments could be to advance this? Sure, I think they can play many different roles. I think the national labs are, while they do a lot of great basic R&D, they, I think, are particularly good at um, doing these small scale demonstration projects. NREL, and I'm sure others, but NREL in particular, works a lot with utilities who are on the front lines of renewable energy procurement. A uh, utility has a lot of distributed solar coming online. They're not sure how to handle it. They come to NREL, NREL can do some analysis for them. NREL has test beds where they can actually deploy these technologies at scale. They just, NREL uh, expanded their capabilities for that recently, building a, a pretty large microgrid. So I think that kind of demonstration is great. I co-authored a, a chapter with Wendy Jacobs on uh, carbon capture and sequestration actually, and how we deeply decarbonize through CCS. And there we talk about uh, opportunities for the federal government to also do more demonstration, like having a network of CO2 pipelines and a sequestration site that they set up or help sponsor or partly subsidize just to get something that we know we need, whether it's CCS in industry or in the power sector or in direct air capture, demonstrating that, look, we know how to put these things underground. We will write off the liability for this or assume the liability from the get-go. And then you get some industry purchase and some industry experience. and you know, industry can be a very conservative thing. And so having that experience now and demonstrating that these technologies are not crazy things that here we will help you get this going at first, I think can be a really valuable role to play. I think the equity um, situation is a very complex one. One of the, uh, the ACEEE just had a report 
uh, and they found that 13% of U.S. households uh, spend more than 10% of their monthly uh, income on energy. And that is just an incredible number. And this is where you get into the intersection of uh, working on climate change with working on social issues. If, you've, if you're a renter, then what are the incentives that you and your landlord face to improve your energy efficiency? And if that's never getting done, and if you're stuck in the energy breeder, and then what happens? And if you're not accumulating wealth because you don't own a home because of policies that existed 10, 20, 30 years ago, then, I mean, it's, it's a really sticky issue in there, I think. Um, having more people at the table talking about procedural justice, thinking about um, how can we not just let these technologies naturally diffuse through the ecosystem, but think about how we can employ them in a targeted manner and, and you know, recognize that not everybody's going to be able to afford to put a solar panel on the roof. So how can we design policies that help that I think are all um, really important issues. The federal government, I think, can play a, a big role. It already has these pro programs, the SBIR and the STTR program, for example, to engage in some of these small demonstration products to uh, projects to get products to market. So this is, um, uh, I did a report with the National Academies uh, at the Department of Energy. So we can get a lot of these ideas from um, many different quarters through not just mentoring programs, but also recruiting for people to apply to these programs who are in non-traditional areas who aren't necessarily on the coast, who are say in Atlanta or in San Antonio uh, to make sure that you get uh, diverse ideas and diverse people working on these ideas. So I think the federal government has a big role. Another very practical role they have to play is helping to lower the price. I mean, by purchasing more, Let's say uh, if, if there's a, a large mandate to purchase um, uh, some lamps, uh, uh, all kinds of technologies, uh, you can lower the price that way. So why not do that? We're, we're supporting farmers who are uh, hurting from these tariffs, you know, that have been, uh, in my view, self-inflicted. We can deploy resources to systematically lower prices so that they can be affordable. So we don't have this perceived stark trade-off between equity and efficiency. Thank you. Joseph, quickly, and then I, we're running out of time, so I want to give everyone a chance to make some last remarks, one last question. So go ahead on this. Yeah, I think I, I'll, I'll, I'll echo Lisa's um, comments on the role of the federal government. I think you know one way we think about this at the Niskanen Center is and and sort of the, the the question I posed to Julian is the thing that drives innovation that really moves you from some point along the research and development scale to market penetration is is our prices and and a carbon price is a tool that's going to draw a lot of innovation right and, and it's cool to get DOE funding I'm I'm absolutely arm in arm on that point. But private R&D in the United States it vastly overwhelms government spending and lots of sectors of the economy. And we can we want it to do that. And I think we can do it in this case, too. And there's an, the equity side of that or the equity side to carbon pricing is real, but it's something we've thought a lot about. So when you look at sort of achieving general outcomes, whether it's by dividend or tax or tax changes or, or plussing up a variety of, of anti-poverty or, or energy price issues for, for uh, affected communities, I think we can answer a lot of these questions using designs that are that are on the shelf. Great, thank you. I believe that we have just a couple minutes left and I would like to give each of you the chance for very brief closing thoughts if there's something you wanted to raise and didn't get a chance to. The other thing I would like to leave everyone with is the thought that we don't want to be myopic here. And while we are in the United States and focused in the United States, uh, climate change is a global problem. And so if any of you have additional quick comments on what other institutions, where is else in the world, is this innovation happening? Does it need to happen? Uh, because we, we can't be um, US centric in solving this problem. Uh, who wants to go first? Lisa. So, uh, so thank you again for this, uh, for this opportunity. Certainly, I brought up switchgrass for a very specific reason. Uh, certainly, most of my work on environmental 
innovation has been in developing countries, say in, uh, in South Africa and Brazil. Uh, so, so bringing not only other countries who would have an interest in this, they would be hyper-motivated why they are suffering from many of these problems, not just environmental racism, and that's, that's a problem too, but we're talking about climate change. They would be hyper-motivated to be parts of these teams and to come up with ideas that could be deployed by all. Brazil, I think, is absolutely one of the canonical examples with respect to uh, sugarcane, uh, sugarcane-based uh, biofuels. So I think that there is a lot more work to be done, a lot more questions to be asked, and I think that this can be uh, an inclusive way across countries to be able to find solutions to these very large problems. Thank you. Next. Julian. I made a move, made a facial expression that was that <laughs> did me in. Uh, okay, uh, I can go, go real quick. I mean, one of the fun things about getting to edit and publish a bunch of bunch of different reports on the whole sort of climate portfolio is I get to see where they fit together and things like that. Um, so you know, at the end of our report, we touch on very briefly, um, you know, some sort of bilateral partnerships that, that or examples of at least one uh, that could be expanded to think about the global problem. And that was uh, the US-India partnership to advance clean energy research. Uh, we have a, a report that is not an innovation report, but it's called the Green Marshall Plan. That's about how climate might reshape foreign policy. Um, the basic idea there is, um, you know, driving down the, the cost of some of these clean energy innovations and then, uh, encouraging other folks around the world to, to purchase them um, and sort of reading between the lines here. It's, it's uh, potentially maybe uh, like a competitor to the, the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, but one thing that these brought up, um, one thing that, that sort of working on all these reports has, has brought up repeatedly is, or two things really, it's, it's firstly that there are some entrenched sort of battle lines, particularly among um, the organized interests that have worked on environmental and climate questions for a long time, uh, that, um, you know, even I think some activists or, or sort of progressive folks are going to have to rethink as we approach some of these problems. Uh, you know, CCS was brought up earlier, there's, there's obviously yeah. some opposition to that among um, organized environmental justice uh, communities, uh, that can bleed sometimes into skepticism of negative emissions technologies. Um, and, you know, of course, the, the prior sort of generations of nuclear have not left a great taste in the mouth of, of many communities, in particular, like, you know, the Navajo Nation and others. Um, and hopefully, you know, the idea is that we can approach some of these questions and get them right with like the next generation of advanced nuclear and all that. So I think that generally speaking, um, these questions demand more open mindedness and sort of a retreat or um, uh, I guess just sort of a greater curiosity than uh, sort of the Cold War prior generations of these debates sort of created battle lines around. Uh, and then secondly, you know, in terms of uh, the equity piece of this, uh, there's, there's just a lot of different ways in which you could think about that. Um, you know, there's domestic equity, there's global equity. Uh, domestically, there are, you know, different competing groups, whether that's, you know, the workers and organized labor, um, communities, you know, consumers. Uh, and, you know, we didn't really grapple with this as much on the page in our reports, um, but it was something that we discussed uh, and have discussed a number of places with various researchers and authors. Uh, and is a, is a challenging thing to, um, to, uh, to necessarily put your finger down and say, like, this is the exact correct way to approach it. Um, so that's just one thing for us to chew on. Great. Michael, closing thought. Yeah, super quick one. Everybody should go read this paper, The Many Possible Climates of the Paris Agreement. We talk about 1.5 degrees C as if it's all hunky-dory. Uh, what we're trying to get to is still a, a pretty um, crazy world with a lot of equity implications. And finally, I would just say that um, we oftentimes, I am susceptible to this. I think a lot of us are. We think of equity on maybe the back end or as a separate issue or maybe an add-on, but there's an amazing opportunity to put that front and center. We're going to be investing billions and billions and billions of dollars, like Leo Silva saying, in innovators and innovation, but then also when you deploy these things. And you know, you can you can make equity the target. Don't make minimizing costs, maybe sacrifice a little bit on the cost side if you can get some uh, get some benefits on that in terms of dealing with equity issues and raising up communities that have not had access to these technologies or not been part of the workforce or uh, suffered from having a coal plant in their backyard. So 
that's it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Joseph, you had some great comments in there to go, but if you have any more and can speak as fast as Michael, go for it. Um, <clears throat> No, just that, you know, thanks to the, the other panelists, really interesting and rewarding discussion. Um, I think I've, I've probably taken up enough airtime and okay. uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to do so. All right. Then I will just close by thanking our four wonderful panelists and Third Way and the University of Michigan for giving us all the opportunity to have this conversation together. Uh, be well. Thank you, Jennifer, Michael, Joseph, Julian, and Lisa. Please welcome Amanda Farthy, a senior undergraduate at the University of Michigan. Hi everyone. Uh, so I am carrying out my master's thesis research with uh, professors Tony Reams and Michael Craig, who's one of our previous panelists. And we are looking at how the inclusion of additional value streams would change how and where cities invest in solar and storage projects. So while decisions for these types of projects are typically made by comparing life cycle costs to energy bill savings, we want to know what would change if the value of climate, health, resilience, and social justice were also included in investment decisions. So this analysis will contribute to the growing body of work on innovative financing approaches and will innovate by drawing more explicit connections between local energy investments, and among other things, community preparedness for dangerous power outage events that are only becoming more and more common. Thank you, Amanda. Please welcome Caitlin Barr, a graduate student at the University of Michigan. I'm studying nuclear engineering here at Michigan, and innovation is important because it allows us to meet the needs of an ever-evolving world. In the case of energy, we need to do this without overtaxing the environment. So in the nuclear field, we innovate both our designs and our policy. In regards to our designs, we've learned that huge reactors don't work for everyone. So I study advanced reactor designs, and I've seen designs of smaller reactors, transportable reactors, reactors that desalinate water. And we innovate to enable flexibility and provide reliable, carbon-free electricity to meet the needs of the community. But we also need to innovate our policy. We acknowledge the unprecedented safety features of revolutionary designs. And in one of my classes, we talk about how we can make sure that we're not holding these new designs to outdated regulations. And we need to continue innovating our designs and our policies as our needs change and grow. Thank you. Please welcome Leah Edelman, a graduate student at the University of Michigan. Hi, my name is Leah. I work under Dr. Sarah Mills with the Graham Sustainability Institute. I'm a public policy student the project that we're currently working on has to do with making all municipalities zoning ordinances across Michigan publicly accessible. This is important because local governments need to know what other local governments near them are doing to incorporate renewable energy into their zoning ordinances. And as we see technology advance and innovate, we need the zoning ordinances to accommodate them. For example, you can think about a few years ago, a zoning ordinance that allows for an 100 foot turbine would be considered really inclusive to new, new technologies. But now that same zoning ordinance has to be updated to accommodate for the new innovation and anything under 500 feet for a wind turbine zoning ordinance allowance um, would be highly uh, unpermissible. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Leah. Please welcome Dominic Bednar a graduate student at the University of Michigan. Hello, hi everybody. My name is Dominic Bednar. I'm a PhD student working with Dr. Tony Reams. My research broadly looks at energy poverty recognition and response in the United States. And what, what we find is that those that are likely to, um, obviously like live in low, low income, inefficient homes are statistically more likely to live in um, inefficient um, housing. Um, and so looking at how do we innovate with recognizing um, and responding to energy poverty, thinking about what types of solutions can we work with by working with communities, but also considering how we might um, innovate the ways in which we collect data to actually measure the problem, um, but also how do we actually evaluate our solutions to the problem. Thank you, Dominic. Please welcome Josh Freed, Senior Vice President of Third Way's Climate and Energy Program. Wow, 
Uh, first, I just wanted to start by saying thank you to our entire audience for what's been a really fast moving, interesting and dynamic set of conversations today, as well as all of our panelists and Richard Kaufman and the entire University of Michigan and Third Way teams for making the second day of the Fastest Path to Zero Summit so successful. Rarely do you get the chance in one day to hear from a world, one of the world's leading economists, one of the leading clean energy finance wizards, grasp the scope of the advanced nuclear market and hear from some of the most thoughtful emerging voices in the climate and energy space. And I'd like to, in addition, especially thank the students from the University of Michigan who just presented their research. It's going to be exciting to see so many new voices uh, get involved in what is one of the most critical issues facing not just our nation, but the world. At a time of the pandemic, abhorrent racial injustice, and the climate enhanced natural disasters we're seeing on TV or experiencing every day, it, it does give me a real sense of hope to hear such dynamic and fresh voices talking about both the opportunities in the technological, financial, and policy innovation that we are developing to help us get to net zero and how people are thinking about making it more human-centered. We must include communities that are impacted by climate change and pollution and harness the creativity and knowledge of ensuring innovation and innovators truly are diverse in a way that unfortunately we haven't seen happen as much as it needs to up to this point. And this conference isn't just here about understanding where we are today. It's about exploring the opportunities for clean energy solutions into the future. And that means supporting engaging with universities like Michigan, where groundbreaking research is really happening today. We hope that you'll join us again next Tuesday at noon Eastern time and 9 a.m. Pacific, when we'll kick off with Dr. Tony Reams, assistant professor at the University of Michigan School for Environment and Sustainability, and my colleague, Lindsay Walter, who's a senior policy advisor here at Third Way. And she will be leading a keynote exploring uh, an exciting joint infrastructure modeling project that we're doing with Third Way, Bipartisan Policy Center and Clean Air Task Force. In addition, Julia Piper from Green Tech Media will be interviewing a surprise guest. One guest, they're a member of the House of Representatives. That leaves you with only about 435 options. And we'll also be discussing equitable climate solutions with Wisconsin Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, Michelle Martinez of the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition, Nathaniel Smith of the Partnership for Southern Equity, and Jason Walsh from the Blue-Green Alliance. And we'll conclude day three with two of our favorite Michiganders, Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist and Dr. Ellen hughes Cromick from Third Way. So thank you again for this really exciting and interesting day, and I hope to see everyone again next week. Take care. Thank you, Josh. We'd like to thank you all for attending the second day of Fastest Path to Zero. Remember, we are back next Tuesday at noon Eastern time. And we'll be joined by Wisconsin Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes, Michigan Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist, and Michelle Martinez from the Michigan Environmental Justice Coalition, and many, many more. Thank you again.